Good afternoon. It's my great honor to um, talk to you about my, my experiences and, and feelings about the Bach pieces, first of all. I could talk about competitions all day, but um, when, uh, I was just talking to Mauricio Fuchs, one of your jurors here, and I, pl I remember playing uh, the G minor fugue, I think, in a competition in the <clears throat> 1988 or something. <laughs> that he was listening to uh, the manual competition a long time ago. So he would have been hearing Bach fugues since 1988 to now and still hearing them. And why? Why are we still, we still hearing this music in every single violin competition? You hear Paganini and Bach in every major competition. Why is that? Well, every violinist can tell you this is, this is something special to us. We live with it. We, we start learning it when we're very young. But why are they required in every competition? I think the simple, I'll talk about Paganini tomorrow, but the, the simple difference between them maybe is that Bach, you get better at as you get older. <laughs> Paganini, when he was my age, he couldn't play Paganini anymore. He started playing the viola, writing different music, um, because his music was relied on such incredible, crazy um, accuracy that, not that he couldn't play Paganini, that might be a bit, bit harsh, a great violinist who's still working today said to me recently that I've uh, retired, I'm not going to say his name, but he's, he's retired the Sibelius Concerto, he's retired the Tchaikovsky Concerto, he's retired the Mendelssohn Concerto, he's still playing Mozart and the Beethoven, he's still playing Brahms. And, and, and I said, well, why did you stop playing those pieces? And he says, well, I can't play them as well as I want to play them. He's probably playing them as well as I'd want to hear him play them, <laughs> but not well enough for him. And the same, I'm sure, with Paganini, he's like frustrated, it's like, well, Maybe he was too busy gambling, I don't know. But, but so we want to hear the Paganini from the young, the young players because that's exactly uh, what, what really separates um, a great musician from a, a merely slightly less great musician. Um, that's one of the, the ways we can tell. But Bach, it, you do get better as you get older in a lot of ways. So we're, we're, we're looking for the musical maturity already in these young violinists that can, can plumb the depths of these masterworks. Now, you know, there are many other solo violin works in the Baroque literature. Why do we want to hear the Bach? There's Telemann, there's Bieber, there's Westhoff. Um, this, this, these are very unusual works. The six solo, he called them the six solos for violin without bass accompaniment. And remember that in Bach's time, all of his music generally had to have a bass, a, a continuo, a bass accompaniment. So this already made this quite unusual. These date from 1720, while Bach was Kapellmeister in Curtin, though we don't know exactly when he started them, but it was this period in his life that he was doing lots of instrumental work. So the great six Brandenburg concertos, the keyboard suites, the English suites, the orchestral suites, many of them, um, the, and the six cello suites, they all come from this period of his life. He started that uh, job in 1717, I believe. But the violin solos, are, they're different from the works that he wrote for cello, for instance, or the keyboard suites, because each of them is a little bit different. They vary in form throughout. And there's three church sonatas, sonatas da chiesa, and three partitas, only one of which, the E major, the very last one, is in the form that's, that is similar to those of the, of the cello suites, really, which is a preludio and a following set of dances, and ending in a gigue. But the other two partitas are, are, are quite different from that as well. And part of the answer to this, why they're all so different, is I, I, I tend to view them as a one unit, as one arc or a journey from the beginning to the end in the Bach suites. And it's a very personal journey, I think, that, that was happening to J.S. Bach. The, first of all, it's an impossible task he set himself on such an instrument with... Uh, a small key, a keyboard, a small fingerboard, and four strings that few other composers have even come close to, to realizing the amount of polyphony and complexity on the solo violin. The best fugue outside of Bach, I think, is by, so far, is by Bela Bartok, and that was written in the 40s, um, which is an incredible, incredible work, but again, it's inspired by what Bach did. He also wrote a chaconne in that, in that sonata as well. But none of this came out of, out of nothing. It, it grew out of what happened before in, in German Baroque music. So there, there were these examples from Westhoff and, and uh, Ignaz Bieber. Bieber wrote a uh, famous Passacaglia way back in uh, 1676, is that right? 
And um, that was the model for Bach's Chacon. But it, it, Bach's Chacon goes, goes far further in that as well. But somehow just the loneliness and the intimacy of the violin on its own without a bass uh, leads us to wonder, and we'll never know for sure, but he also spelt, on the, on the autograph, he spelt it um, S-E-I, say solo in Italian, not expected soli, as a, a, so it would be six soli, but he wrote say solo. In Italian, that can mean you are alone, and the violin is certainly alone in these pieces without a bass. Bach's first wife, Maria Barbara, died in 1720 while he was away on tour. In fact, two months before he came home, he had no idea that she had been dead and buried. Um, and she was perfectly well when he left home. So he returned home to find that she was dead with no documented cause of death. And she bore him seven children. As we know, he went on to have 20 more than that. <laughs> she bore him seven children, but only four of those survived. So the intense shock of that um, moment of his life may well be what some of, behind some of the strange forms that we see in these partitas, especially around the chacon, which is in, in sort of the golden mean. If you take the six sonatas, the golden mean, that's where the chacon happens. And in a lot of his pieces, he uses that um, ratio to, to, to equal the natural beauty that, that he found in music. Um, it's a very enig enigmatic chacon. We'll talk about that if we have time. We're going to hear one of them. We're also going to hear, looks like, 10 fugues. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about, about, about that as well. The, the two church sonatas which are presented here, and today we're going to hear some of the A minors, and the G minor is the other one. The, 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 the G minor is the first one, the A minor is the second. They're very similar in form, but they all have a slow, fast, slow, fast um, outline. But the fugues are quite different, and they, they, they get progressively longer. The first the G minor fugue is marked very fast, and it's inter it'd be interesting to see uh, how the players today are interpreting that. But Bach wrote it in two, and then he said allegro. So if you were to interpret that literally, it, it would be an incredibly, possibly an incredibly fast speed that nobody would ever want to play. That the, the subject itself is only about nine notes long. Did I say about? It is nine months. <laughs> you, you wouldn't hear it that fast, because once you get into all the chords later on, it becomes a huge mess, at least on a modern instrument. Perhaps not on a rock instrument, but that sense of fast too, it'd be interesting to see how the players interpret that. Um, it, the, the, the second fugue, the, the A minor fugue, is also in two. Most fugues should be in two. The third one, the C major one, which we're also going to hear, is also in two. If you, if you go towards the 20th century, um, Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story, the famous fugue in that, also in two. <laughs> the fugue should always be in two, that's my rule. Um, but the, the, the second fugue has, has, has a slower, but a slower um, pulse. <laughs> And so and you hear that upside down and, all, and all, all over the place. It's a much bigger fugue. It's about twice as long as the G minor. And the C major after that, which we're only going to hear one person playing, that's my favorite of the fugues. I mean, the A minor is great. They're all great. But the C major is sort of our cathedral of, of fugues for solo violin. It's ridiculously huge. Um, it's yeah, probably three times as long as the G, the, the G minor. Also because he, in the middle of the fugue, turns it upside down and says uh, El Reverso, and I'm gonna write everything backwards now. And he not only writes the fugue theme backwards, but he, he writes the counter subject backwards. So the fugue theme for that one. I mean, when you turn it backwards, it's hard holding this isn't, and <laughs> talking at the same time, sorry. But when you turn it, he, he does it backwards in the middle. And I'll show the counter subject, and that also goes backwards.
chromatic line that was the, the canvas object going up instead of down in the first time. Another unusual thing about that fugue while I'm on that C major fugue is you would expect this. Like in, in the other fugues you hear go into the subdominant or you go to the dominant after for the second subject, not second subject, the second iteration. You'd hear something in the A minor, you hear like this. where it normally would have gone, but instead he goes immediately to the relative minor, and it becomes suddenly angular and, and chromatic. With changes, with changes in, the, in the chromaticism of the, the actual fugue subject already in like bar four. <laughs> um, so what's going on? So with, with, with the arc of these fugues, I think it's, again, it's within the larger context of the six sonatas and, and the, again, the, the linchpin at the middle of it is all the chaconne. And after the chaconne, it's, it's, it's looking at in a sunnier aspect. It's almost like uh, catharsis. Once we get to the, the C major sonata, there's a more, a more positive outlook. And then he gets to the E major partita, which finishes with a very simple, in a way, very simple and playful set of dances. They get simpler and simpler. In fact, the last three works, the last three bits of the pieces of the E major partita are the easiest pieces in the entire book. Most of it is incredibly difficult. They get easier and easier. And there's almost this optimistic, hopeful, childlike simplicity about the end of them. And I think that's when he's gone through a process of grieving, of thinking, of, of moving. There's obviously going to be religious aspects to it as well. But there's very much a journey that occurs throughout this music. And the fugues are they're a big part of that, um, of, the, of that journey. And they get bigger and bigger and more complex. And um, they really they, they take this instrument um, to, to a, whole, a whole different set of possibilities. Uh, we're, while we're on the subject of the A minor, the, the Bieber Passacaglia I mentioned earlier starts with this, with this group of four notes, which you hear about. Yeah, too, ma too many times in that piece. But anyway, this is the this traditional Chaconne four notes. And once, once you start getting, um, when it goes into fourth like this, you know it's not Bach, you know it's pre-Bach because it does, he does this. Never hear that in Bach, but you do hear weird things like the uh, odd parallel fifth in, in in the solo violin sonatas, and that's sort of hidden very very expertly by Bach anyway. But um, those four notes at the beginning of the A minor sonata, probably not by accident, but we would be looking to hear those notes brought out by the player, and and where they recur throughout the work. It, it starts instead of a G, I start on a G. They start on an A, but here they are. Except the violin doesn't go any lower than that, so Bach goes up. So actually, is what begins the A minor sonata, and it's and you hear it through the chords. on. So that's one, one big aspect that is the challenge for the player is voicing and how to bring out these the bass notes, that, the bass lines that might be there, the, the tenor lines, the soprano lines. And speaking of lines, of, I've got to, to make sure I'm not going over time. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> well, so at the end of the, uh, let's say the A minor fugue, for example, there's a whole bunch of chords and the melody that I played earlier, the fugue subject, sometimes it's upside down. sometimes the right way up, as, as I played earlier, but it's spread out through a bunch of chords. So just at the very end, you'll hear. Sorry. So 
through that, those chords, the, the tune is thrown around in different parts of the instrument. And you'll want to hear somehow where the player can, can show that with the bow, of course, and with lengthening the notes and, and to be shown that they're aware that those things are happening. There's all, there's all sorts of choices that they would have to make as well. In the, in the G minor fugue, there are places that Bach didn't write to arpeggiate, but people traditionally do arpeggiate them. But I, I prefer not to arpeggiate them. So you might hear um, these group of chords. You might hear them as a... We'll do them all kinds of different ways. In that place, I like to do it just as it's written. So you, I'm sure you would get several versions of that, or we'll see what people do with it. And the Chaconne as well. Um, when, I, when I first learned my Chaconne in the early 80s, it was a lot less historically informed in those days, was, was the mainstream. And, and the first way I learned it was with all of these wrong <laughs> things that editors have put in. And there's a whole big, long section in the Chaconne that is just marked to arpeggiate one way. And when I first learned it, we just thought that was too boring, and Carl Flesch had made an addition where you change two different different bowings throughout. But the whole section, actually, I'm sure what we hear now is, is it's all all done the same way, and it starts. The problem is that the amount of notes change throughout. So if Bach writes. There's groups of two notes, and when we get to when there's four note chords, and then sometimes three note chords, um, and then back to four, how do you keep that rhythm even and so forth? So that it's the challenge for the player to, to bring out the lines that they're looking for and show the variations that are they're happening throughout. Um, yeah, so it, 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 there, there are many problems and a lifetime of, of challenges for, for each player when they're approaching this music. But as I say, you'll hear many, many fugues. And my favorite being the C, but it's a favorite of, of an amazing bunch. Um, and I think, yeah, I've got to stop now. <laughs> I could talk about just the Chacon all day, but they're, they're all such great pieces. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing new realizations. It'll be 200, 200 years, 300 years next year since he wrote them. <laughs> so um, yeah, and, and it's just as fresh today as it was 300 years ago. All right, I hope you enjoyed it.